Good morning. It's a privilege to uh, open the word again this morning and uh, from Romans chapter 11. We're going to be in Romans 11 today. Uh, excited for this passage. It's a long passage. Uh, I'm glad the uh, Bills game got moved out. Um, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, and we will read from verse 11 to verse 24 today. And uh, the title of the message I put is, uh, We are grafted in. We are grafted in, the Gentiles. Romans 11 and verse 11 onwards. I say then, have they stumbled? that they should fall, certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches to the, for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, in as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being the wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them become the partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Verse 21, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off, the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and let's uh, look to the Lord again in prayer. Almighty God, your thoughts towards us are great. Uh, they are for the good. We do not perceive and understand everything that you have in plan for mankind, but we know that you have done all things well. And Almighty God, as we open your word and as, as we ponder on your plan for the nation of Israel, your people, and as we look into the blessings that have been wrought through that for us Gentiles. Help us, Lord, to appreciate that. Help us, Lord, to understand the great and awesome God that we serve. And help us to have grateful hearts, Almighty God. You have done all things well. You have done great things for our souls. Father, we pray that as we open your word, that you would help us in the understanding of your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So uh, last week from Romans chapter 11 and verse 1 to 10, uh, we uh, looked at the primary aspect it opened up with, has God cast away his people? And the vehement answer from the Lord God of heaven, the divine response was no, absolutely not. He has not canceled or annulled the promises to national Israel. And the one word proof 
that he hasn't done this, the one word proof that the word of God is the true and living word of God is Israel. God's faithfulness to Israel uh, is proof that God will continue to do that work until he finishes it. He who began a good work will complete it. He will complete it. God is true to his promises uh, and true to his love, unchanging and unwavering. And in spite of their sin, just like us, in spite of their sin, in spite of their rejection, in spite of their unbelief, there is still a place for the nation of Israel in God's plan. Most of Israel is set aside today in God's purposes because of their rejection of the Messiah and, and because of unbelief, and we will look into that later today. Their setting aside is not total. It's not total, but partial. It's not permanent, but temporary. I say not total because there is a remnant today of Israel that believes the Messianic Jews. I say it's not permanent because, uh, but temporary because of what God will do in restoring them back unto himself as we will read uh, in verse 23 and 24. And so today we are looking at verses 11 to 24 and over there we will try to understand a little more about the greatness and the faithfulness of God and what God is trying to accomplish through Israel's being set aside or through Israel's transgression or sin. What is God trying to accomplish today? And so in verse 11 we read, I say then that they have, they stumbled, yeah, have they stumbled that they should fall? And again, the answer there is vehement, certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So Israel rejected their Messiah. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, uh, when the Lord uh, uh, proclaimed uh, the good news to them, uh, they rejected the Messiah. They rejected the Messiah and they nailed him to the cross. And they continue to reject him. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, and verse 6 to 8, we read that therefore to those who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, in this instant Israel, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being what? They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. They were appointed, they were given the word of God, uh, but they were disobedient to the word of God to which they were appointed. And so they stumble. They stumble at the chief cornerstone. And so the question is, has their stumbling resulted in them falling? And the word falling there, uh, in that first instance there, have they stumbled so that they should fall. The Greek word for fall that is used there is utterly destroyed. Have they stumbled so that they, are they utterly destroyed as a result of their stumbling? Now stumbling is a temporary transient event, but falling is an end state event. Have they stumbled so that they utterly fall? Have they tripped? They're stumbling, they ha and the answer there is no, absolutely not, certainly not. Uh, the following verse there, um, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Again, it's very confusing unless you look into the Greek of some of these words. Uh, but through their ut utter fall or to their utter destruction. No, that's not the word fall that is used there. The word fall that is used subsequently, there is a word sin or transgression. And so you can read it like this, verse 12. Now, if their fall or sin or transgression is riches for the world and their failure or their lack or their shortcomings are riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness be? And so here is a picture of 
a lack or failure contrasted to fullness. If God is using the lack or failure or Israel being set aside to bring salvation and riches to the Gentiles, how much more will the riches and blessings be when Israel as a nation accepts the Lord Jesus Christ? That will be a beautiful, glorious day in that millennial kingdom, in that millennial reign when Christ Jesus, uh, as we read today uh, during the Lord's Supper from Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10, when he, the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ, will be a banner for his people and the Gentiles will seek him. Today, the Lord pursues and seeks the Gentiles, but in that day, the Gentiles will seek the banner, the root of Jesse. And that will be a glorious day, and that will be, and his resting place will be glorious, is what we read. Oh, I look forward to that day. The, when the fullness of the Jews have come upon, uh, and the fullness, so to speak, uh, brings forth blessings for the Jews and for the Gentiles. So moving on, uh, so has their stumbling resulted in them falling? Absolutely not. And so now the purpose. So we're gonna get a, get a little more deeper into this. Salvation has come to the non-Jewish world, uh, to you and me Gentiles, and that is God's, uh, one of God's purposes. He uses all these things for the good. Uh, even when we think that, uh, you know, things are absolutely dire, God uses those dire things, God uses those things even to accomplish his glory. And that is what he is doing here through the people of God that God had chosen, uh, for whom was given the glory, the law, the blessings, uh, and they rejected the Messiah. And so now God brings forth salvation to you and me through our Savior Jesus Christ, of the root of Jesse, of the root of Abraham. And that is the blessings that have come upon us. And we will see this time and again today in the later analogies throughout these verses. Now, a question for all of us to ponder and think about. How did the Gentiles in the Old Testament come to, the God, come to God? How did they come to God? How did Abraham come to God? The answer is this, by grace alone, through faith alone, and not of works. It was the same in the Old Testament, and it is the same today in the New Testament. We read in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God. After the establishment of Israel as a chosen people, God's purposes, uh, God's divine purpose was his people would be a light to the world, light to the Gentiles. And that was his purpose and intention all the way around. The Gentiles prior to the time of Christ came through uh, uh, the witness of Israel, through the witness of Israel being the light to the non-Jewish world. They embraced Israel as a, you know, they had to embrace Israel as a nation in order to seek refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. Examples of Gentiles that came back, came, came to the Lord. Um, we know of Ruth. Ruth in Ruth 1 and verse 16, we read of Ruth telling Naomi, uh, entreat me not to leave you uh, or to turn back from following you for where you go, I will go. Your uh, where you lodge, I will lodge. Uh, your people will be my people, and your God, my people. Uh, your God, my God. And note over there the order in which Ruth would say that. Uh, she would first embrace the people. Your people will be my people. Your nation will be my nation. Your land will be my land. And then your God my God. She approached God on the ground of the covenant promises of God, even to Abraham. Other examples we see of Naaman. Uh, you can read that in 2 Kings chapter 5. We read of uh, Naaman the Syrian who would embrace the God of Israel. He would even take dirt from the land of Israel and he would go back <laughs> and 
he would, so that he would have opportunity to worship the Lord through the covenant promises that God has established with Abraham. We read um, of other people. We read of um, of Esther. In Esther, we read that the Jews. Uh, that the Jews embraced the nation of Israel in the end after Haman was hanged uh, and the Jews embraced the nation. They came, uh, embraced the God of Israel and embraced the nation. So how could this now happen when Israel is in disobedience? So Israel was supposed to be the light. Uh, the nations would come and approach the God of Israel through the light that was shining out as God's chosen people to the world, and the Gentiles were believing in that, just like Ruth did the Moabitess, just like Naaman did the Syrian, just like um, uh, the people of Shushan or uh, Iran or Persia did uh, in embracing the God of Israel. But when they are in darkness, when there is no light that is shining out through them because of their sin and because of their rejection of the Messiah, how then will that light go out? But God, <laughs> but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were in our transgressions and sins, he sought us and he brought us. God, who is rich in mercy, is the answer there. But God would bring forth salvation to you and me through the disobedience and through the unlight and the darknesses that would happen through Israel. He would bring forth that light to us so that we would be the light to the Gentiles. Again, I have to reemphasize uh, that we are not a replacement for Israel. We are not an extension for Israel. But God has given us a special place, just like he did with Israel. And he has a plan and a future for them. So going back, salvation has come to you and me through Christ Jesus. And the Gentiles will, and the Gentile, yeah, and the Gentiles will make the Jewish nation jealous, as our brother prayed. And, and, and the national, and eventually, and, and, and this is a circle, and, and there will be Jewish revival as a result of the fullness of the jealousy that would come forth by seeing all these Gentiles that are being saved and grafted in uh, to the blessings of Abraham. Uh, there will be Jewish people that will embrace the Savior, their Messiah, whom they missed when they rejected him. And that will lead to the fullness, fullness, so to speak, for the Gentiles and for the Jews in the coming day. Greater riches for the world, both Jews and Gentiles. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts, uh, Acts chapter 13. And just to give you a picture of how this happened, how this transpired. Uh, time and again, Paul uh, would go forth to Ephesus, he would go forth to Antioch. He would go forth to Rome. And one of the things that he would do is he would go in to the synagogues first. Now keep in mind that Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. But he would always go, you know, in many instances, I would say, not always, in many instances, go to the synagogue and he would open the scriptures and he would show them the Christ. And when they would reject him, what would he say? So be it, I'm now going to the Gentiles. And so uh, one instance of that, there are many instances, one instance of that we will read. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 14 we read, uh, you know, we read that you know, uh, uh, he went, they went into the synagogue on the, on the Sabbath today and fast forward to verse 44, verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Uh, and this is in Antioch, just, just for reference. And verse 45 we read, but when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with what? With envy, with jealousy. Uh, the word has gone to the Gentiles through Paul and Barnabas, and that has caused jealousy in the hearts of the Jews, the Pharisees, and reading on, and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. 
Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. <laughs> and then we read that the Gentiles gladly received God's word, glorified the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. <laughs> you know, just an example there of how the word of God came to the Jews first, they rejected it, and then the blessings would go forth onto the gen Gentile nations that would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So provoking, you know, so, so the next, next aspect here is a profitable jealousy or envy as we just read. You know, provoking uh, the Gentiles as the Gentiles grow in number, uh, uh, the ge believing Gentiles grow in number, that will provoke the Jewish nation uh, to jealousy. You know, when today there are about 16 million uh, people who believe in Judaism or are so-called Jews, uh, there are about 2.3 billion Christians, again, uh, Christians in name, uh, or Christ followers. Uh, the Lord knows the accurate numbers. But then what I'm trying to uh, point here is this. Uh, there is no greater influential man that has ever walked on the face of the earth other than the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other person of Jewish descent that would walk the face of the earth than our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are two billion people that embrace the Lord God of heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. And wouldn't that provoke the small Jewish nation, 0.2% uh, uh, of the entire population of the world? Will that not provoke them to jealousy? In a future day, uh, we read in Zechariah chapter 12, uh, and verse 10, and I probably must have referenced it in my last message, but this is a glorious verse. We read over there that I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one that grieves for his firstborn. You know, this is the hypothetical, yet absolutely certain to happen fullness that will come upon the nation of Israel. Today, they are being provoked to jealousy by our fates, but eventually they will see the Messiah for himself and they will be drawn to him. Israel's temporary blindness and rejection are strategically used by God to bring salvation to us. God is working salvation even through those who are rejecting salvation. Yeah, how great is our God? How great and amazing is his plans for us? So now, uh, verse 13. So Paul transitions and makes it even more personal. Now he brings forth his personal element to the message here. Uh, and the, the section here is uh, strategic and expectant evangelism strategic and expectant evangelism. So verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Paul specifically was called to minister to the Gentiles, although he had a heart and longing for the Jewish nation. Uh, we would read earlier on, uh, I believe it was in Romans 9 or Romans 10, uh, you know, he would, he would uh, desire that, like, they would come to know Christ Jesus, uh, even to the point of, like, if he were to be the accursed, he'd rather see them come to saving grace. But Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles. He was called to the Gentiles. Paul had great hope and expectations for the Jewish nation's salvation. 
you know, if anyone has lost hope for the Jews, um, Paul did not. He magnified his ministry to the Gentiles because he sees the Gentiles as missionaries to the Jewish people. Paul had great hopes for the salvation of the Jews, even when he knew and preached the fact that they were set aside today because of their sin. Even when he knew that God had judicially blinded their eyes, he still had great hope for their blinders or their scales falling off so that they would see Christ Jesus. He looked at the Jews as a great mission field for the gospel. Yeah, there's a lesson for us in this. There's a, an absolute lesson for us in this. You know, are there times when we feel like we preach the gospel, or share the gospel time and again with people, and they solidly are blinded and they choose to reject the Lord God of heaven, choose to reject our Savior? Are there instances like that? And, and many a times we develop this thought, oh, they're far too gone. They cannot be reached. They're far too gone. You know, uh, and Brother Cecil, I'm sure, will uh, have many examples of this, where gospel tracts would be given, and there would be gospel tracts that would be thrown back at you. I did not want the message. But the example of Paul here is this. Expect great things, not because we are doing any great things, but because we serve a great God. Expect great things from a great God who will draw all men to himself. There is no blindness that cannot be opened by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of God. There is no blindness that is too blind that your eyes cannot be opened. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or imagine because of the power of God the blood of the lamb that was slain for us. So again, in this, uh, you know, Paul's example, he would use this strategically. He would be a messenger to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would provoke the Jewish nation uh, to see that the Gentiles are worshiping their Messiah whom they crucified so that they would eventually be drawn back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Strategic an expectant evangelism. And may that be an example for each and every one of us, and may it not discourage us when we see people that are blinded and rejecting the gospel today. He sought us, he brought us into the fold, and so he will uh, with the Jewish nation. Verse 15, but if them being cast away is reconciling the world, what will their what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Yeah. The riches that the world has received is reconciliation. Restoring of a broken relationship uh, between God and man through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, we would read, He himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken do down the middle wall of separation that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. The Jew and the Gentile, the wall of separation is now broken through the cross. If they were blindness, blinded, their blindness can be lifted. If they were brought out, they can be brought in. If they were dead, so to speak, uh, there is resurrection life that can be brought through the gospel. This is the revival among the Jews, life from the dead. This is a picture of the resurrection here, a revival picture, an extensive revival that will come upon uh, the world in a, a, a coming day, uh, come upon the Jewish nation in a coming day. Uh, life from the dead, uh, resurrection of the world uh, to a millennial glory. The prodigal son will come back home. The picture is that of Ezekiel, uh, that Ezekiel portrayed in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 5, where we read of the dry bones or dead bones that are dead and in the grave, but God gives them life. 
God gives them flesh and God gives them life. So a resurrection, so to speak, from the dead, a transition of, of from deadness to life that only God can provide. So of them being cast away is reconciling the world. What will be their acceptance be but a glorious revival or life for these dead bones? Moving on, uh, in, in the subsequent verses, in verse 16 onwards, we see uh, two analogies that now God is trying to portray or through Paul uh, to reinforce what he has already stated. And the two pictures uh, that we see here to enrich this message is one, the picture of a cer the ceremonial life of the Jewish nation in the dough. We will get into that. And then uh, a picture of horticulture or uh, arbory culture uh, where uh, cultivation of trees or plants take place. So verse 16, if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also holy. The root is holy, so are the branches. Now, both of these arguments are from a lesser to a greater, uh, from a part to a whole. In Numbers, uh, the first instance, uh, talking about the first fruit is holy, then the lump is holy, comes from Numbers chapter 15. You don't have to turn there. In Numbers chapter 15 and verse 17, we read, of the first fruits of your dough, you shall give to the Lord as a heap offering in your generations. You know, part of God's teaching to the children of Israel was that everything belonged to God. Everything was consecrated to him. Uh, and the act of giving a small portion, that is the small piece of dough of the whole lump, uh, you know, was to tell that God, this is all yours and I dedicate this to you. And so if the part is dedicated and consecrated to you, the whole is also dedicated and yours and yours alone. So what was the idea here that the Lord was trying to teach them? What is the first fruit or the, or the, the dough that is offered to the Lord representing? In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 2 we read, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. So the first fruit here is speaking of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Joseph, uh, the fathers to whom the promises and the covenant were given. The idea here is that uh, a portion affects the whole. If one portion of the Jewish people were consecrated, Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and Joseph, then will not the rest also? And that is what God is trying to convey here through Paul. If the first dough is holy, then the whole lump is holy. The lump here reference, references the current or the present nation of Israel, the current or present nation of Israel in that day during Paul's time and even today. Uh, holy here would mean devoted to the Lord or consecrated to him, dedicated to him, a place of rest, uh, as we read in Isaiah 11. Uh, that place of rest is not yet, but uh, God who had promised to Abraham rest will also fulfill that rest in his people Israel. So if the dough is holy, or if a small portion of the bigger lump of dough is holy, then uh, the whole dough is holy, in the sense of if Abraham and Isaac uh, and Jacob were consecrated to God, then so also one day this nation that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will be consecrated to God. The second part of verse 16, if the root is holy, so are the branches. Exact same analogy here. The root here is the ancient uh, Israel, the fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And the branches uh, here reference the natural branches that were on this olive tree. And they represent the modern day Israel or the current Israel. Moving on to verse 17. And here is the crafting process that happens to explain how the Gentiles came into the fullness of the blessings of Abraham through Christ Jesus. Verse 17, if some of the branches were broken off, you being the wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. 
So olive trees are the most prominent trees. Uh, if you go to Israel uh, and Palestine, uh, the most prominent tree that you would see in Israel and Palestine is the olive tree. It is of great e economic significance uh, to the nation. It is very useful. It is uh, a productive and a valuable tree for Israel. It is a tree that um, is a symbol for Israel. Uh, the olive tree uh, can resist any kind of drought environment. The olive tree can grow in the wilderness. It can grow in poor soil. It can grow with a lack of water. It is very resilient and a picture of the nation of Israel even today. Um. The prophecy of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 11 and verse 16, you don't have to turn there and I'll read that. Uh, Talking about Israel, uh, Jeremiah the prophet would say this. The Lord called your name green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire on it and its branches are broken. And this is exactly what we read here in the passage uh, before us in Romans chapter 11. The old roots representing Abraham and uh, Jacob and the fathers, uh, the wild branches representing the Gentile nation or representing each of us are grafted into this tree, so to speak, the olive tree, and thereby bringing forth productivity. The trunk of the olive tree is the trunk of blessing. It is the trunk of a special rights and relationship, right relationship and the blessings that flow through that trunk uh, is the trunk, it is the trunk of blessing. If the roots are the fathers, if the trunk is the blessings that come forth uh, through God's covenant uh, to the nation of Israel and to the Gentiles through their grafting in, that is, that is the trunk. A space, a space of special nearness to him being set apart from the rest of the world with the special privileges and blessings. The nation of Israel was first in the line uh, to have this privilege, but because of their rejection of, of the Messiah, they are being set aside. And in this instance, we read that they are broken off. Broken off, cast away, uh, no. Uh, permanently, no. Uh, totally, no. And we read over here, some of them, right? So the unbelieving Jews are set aside so that the Gentiles would be grafted in. You being the wild olive tree were grafted in. You know, the grafting is a, a very delicate process. Uh, I haven't done any grafting, but I have heard and listened to many who have done grafting. Uh, the Lord grafts the Gentiles uh, into the blessings of Abraham through Christ Jesus. A successful graft requires the vascular cambium of the stock to be perfectly aligned uh, with the scion or the branch that comes, uh, yeah, the wild branch uh, has to be cut appropriately and then the root of the stock has to be cut appropriately and the vascular cambiums have to be properly aligned so that nutrients will go forth and it will end up being a branch where even if you put it under the microscope, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was a graft. And in its ultimate state, so to speak, it will bear forth great fruits. No one will know uh, whether this was grafted in or not. And that is how the Lord has dealt with us as Gentiles. He has grafted us in. The word grafting that is used there is used six times in four verses only in this chapter. And this verse, uh, this word is a word uh, egg can, can trezo, uh, hard to pronounce it, but it means this, to cut in with a sting, to cut in with a sting. The sting as in the sting of a scorpion, the sting as in the, the, the sting of a bee, to cut in with a sting is that word that is used there. Uh, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who has grafted us in through the death 
through the sting of death of our Savior on the cross of Calvary. And nothing can break that apart. So the Lord grafts them to the Lord grafts us into the blessings of the covenant promise. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 43, we read of the Lord Jesus Christ giving the example of the master and the vineyard. Uh, they would, the master would send servants to the vineyard. They would reject him. They would kill them. All those things. Then they would send. Then he would send the son, the son. Uh, and, and the wine dressers, what would they do? They would take him out of the vineyard and they would kill him. And therefore the Lord would tell, the Lord would tell the wicked wine dressers this in verse 43 of Matthew 22. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Hmm. Uh, Israel, the wine dressers rejected the savior and so the fruits have come upon the Gentiles. Uh, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Now, speaking of the root, partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. I just want to spend a little time there. Partaking of the root and the fatness of the riches of the olive tree. Uh, we, dr we draw all our fatness and we partake of all the blessings because we are grafted into the covenant of salvation uh, that God wrought uh, initially through Abraham and through his seed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now the Gentiles are in a position of favor. Uh, the Gentiles are able to bear fruit because they have their perfect grafting in Christ Jesus. And we read in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14 that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This is a fatness. This is the fatness and the riches that we as Gentiles have received uh, by being partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. The fatness, the riches signifies the privileges or the blessings that have flowed to the Gentiles uh, through Christ Jesus. Verse 18 to 24, I'm going to fast forward. 18 to 24, there are three three warnings that are given to uh, all of us, the Gentiles, the believing Gentiles today. Anti-Semitism has found its way into the church at large. Uh, uh, people uh, uh, that are God's people that are grafted in to the olive tree are now arrogant and prideful and are boasting against the natural branches that are set aside, that is Israel. And so the first warning here is this, Reject spiritual pride or arrogance. Don't be proud and boastful uh, as if you were a better branch than the one that was cut out. God picked me over them, so I must be better. <laughs> uh, you rejected the Messiah, you are done, but I am in. Uh, you had the law, the glory, the promises, you threw them all away through unbelief and rejected and crucified your own Messiah. And we are adopted into the family of God. We are blessed. We are blessed and you're doomed. We should reject this kind of pride. Why should we reject this kind of pride? Because it states here that we were the wild branches. We were very wild. Remember where you came from. Ephesians chapter 2 we read, but you were aliens in the commonwealth of Israel. Uh, Strangers in the covenant of promise, without God, without hope, but now you're grafted in, in Christ Jesus. It is a gift, it is the grace of God, it is not of works. So you shouldn't boast. <laughs> so you shouldn't boast. The root supports you, not you supporting the root. It is through Abraham's blessings uh, through Christ Jesus that we have been enriched. Saints, we've been blessed because we've been grafted into the stock of Semitic blessing that came through Abraham. If you are, uh, if you are in Galatians 3, uh, I'll just read verse 6 to 8. Galatians 3, verse 6 to 8. Galatians 3 is so much of a parallel to Romans chapter 11. Galatians 3, verse 6 to 8, we read, Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, 
Therefore know that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. That is the root. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you, that is in the root, all the nations will be blessed. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Mm. The blessings of Abraham flow, are flowed down to us through our adoption, through our grafting, through our cutting in, so to speak, with a sting, that perfect grafting into the stock. We are partakers of the fatness and the root. Uh, the Lord would tell the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is from the Jews, through the stock of David, through the stock of, uh, of the fathers, through the covenant promises. So do not boast. Uh, the second warning that is given here is reject complacency and unbelief. Reject complacency and unbelief. And we see that from verse 19 to 21. Uh, the branches, the natural branches were broken off because of unbelief. This is an aspect, of, this is an issue of faith. You either believe or you do not believe. If you are not a believing branch, uh, in, in, in the sense of that natural branches or Israel, they did not believe, they rejected him. And so they were cut off, so to speak, cut off in the sense of being set aside. It was unbelief that caused them to reject God. And so we read in verse 20, do not be haughty or do not be high-minded uh, because this is an aspect of belief and faith. You stand in faith, but they were in unbelief. And therefore have a healthy reverential fear of where you came from and the grace and the goodness of God. In verse 21, we read, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you. You know, when, when, when we read this, uh, you know, some of you may think, oh, can salvation be lost? No. Uh, he will not spare you is not about losing salvation, but of our inability for us as Gentiles who believing and who are grafted in to be used by God. Uh, you know, you can end up being disqualified from uh, what God might want to do with your life um, if we are not obedient and walking in the goodness of God. He will discipline you because of your unbelief at times and because of your constant rejection of the word. He will cut you off from the place of usefulness uh, by your rejection of the truth. Uh, you uh, will not a savor in the blessings that God has provided for you through Christ Jesus when you, uh, as a believing Gentile, reject him time and again because of your sin. So reject complacency and unbelief so that God can use you for his work and for his glory. In verse 22, we read, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. And that is point three or the third warning. Take seriously the goodness of God and the severity of God. Take seriously the goodness of God. Take seriously the goodness of God. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Relish in the goodness of God daily. Uh, that in the ages to come that he might show forth his exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness or goodness towards us in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 verse 7. And also take seriously the severity of God. Uh, the severity is the word that is used there is to cut off shortly. Uh, when, we, when we set aside the goodness of God and when we do not believe the truth of his word, he will discipline us in order to woo us back to himself just as he is doing with Israel today. And when Israel ceased believing, they were cut off and only the remnant remained and it doesn't mean that they lost their salvation. The trunk of blessing uh, uh, is still there and God will woo them back to himself through his master plan when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ when they see him. 
And we have the same sins in the church today. Uh, uh, and God deals with us and disciplines us. Uh, sins of self-centeredness, sins of pride, as we just read, or boasting, sins of idolatry, sins of adultery, unbelief, and all of that. Uh, God will not turn a blind eye to that because we are sons, and he desire for us to be in a proper and right relationship with him. He desires for us to live the resurrection life now, the eternal life now, as we meditated upon a couple of weeks back. And so the severity of God in his discipline for us so that we would repent. And in verse 23 to 24 uh, is the glorious ending to our passage here. Uh, it ends with God's unfailing promise of restoration and revival for Israel. Uh, God would say in verse 23 that if they do not continue in unbelief, that is if they believe, they will be grafted in, talking about Israel. And God is able. That is beautiful. God is able. It's not Israel's faithfulness. It is not our faithfulness. It's not our works. But it's God who is faithful and who is able that will graft them back in because of his faithfulness and because of who he is. God is able. He will give life to the dry bones or the dead bones as we will, he will give flesh to these dry bones and he will bring them back to life. Uh, I will leave you with this example of Apostle Thomas. <laughs> Apostle Thomas was a picture of the Jewish nation today. Thomas was called Doubting Thomas uh, and we still call him Doubting Thomas because he doubted in unbelief. Uh, Thomas was absent when the Lord Jesus Christ first appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. And then when the disciples would tell Thomas that, hey, we have seen the Lord Jesus Christ, we read in John chapter 20 and verse 25 of Thomas saying this to uh, the disciples and the, that, them that were around him. Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And this is the plain picture of Israel today. Uh, the time will come when the Lord Jesus Christ will reveal himself to Israel just like he did with Thomas. The Lord will be gracious to Israel just like he is gracious to us. He will break open their open hearts of stone by the revelation of his pierced hands. The Lord invited Thomas when the Lord would appear to Thomas in the midst of all the disciples, the Lord would go to Thomas again, and the Lord appealed to Thomas, and he would invited Thomas to touch him, to put his fingers in his wounded hands, to put his hand on the side of the Savior that was pierced. The Lord dealt graciously with Thomas, and so he will deal graciously with Israel, just as he deals graciously with us and our sins. And in such a way, God will deal with him and them in a future day and restore them back to himself. So I'll leave you with one question for us to ponder on. What should our attitude be towards modern Israel? What should our attitude be towards modern Israel today? With all the things that are going on in the Middle East today, with the wars that are in Israel, what should my attitude as a Christian be? Our attitude, I would say, should be an attitude of hope for Israel. Not hype, as one of the brothers pointed out. Not hype, but hope. Not all the things that Israel does today is perfect uh, and right. Uh, I, I definitely cannot approve all the things that they do uh, and everything that they do in unbelief today. Uh, Tel Aviv might be one of the most um, liberal uh, cities, sinful cities uh, in the world today. But in spite of all those things, our attitude should be that of general hope, not because they are a great people, but because of the greatness of our God. We want to have a general positive stance towards Israel because of who God is and because God is a restorer of them that are broken. And he will make all things new. 
He has a special place for the believing Israel. He has a great plan for redemption and restoration. And he will make that happen. And we look forward to that glorious day when the Lord will make all things new. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your perfect plan. The plan of salvation that you wrought through the root of Jesse, through uh, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, through the Semitic seed would come forth our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh Father God, for grafting us in. May we never be boastful. May we never be prideful. May we be a people of hope for not just the Jewish nation, but all those who reject the Savior today. For you will us that no one perish, but that all come to the saving knowledge of your grace. And Almighty God, help us to be strategic and a hope-filled people as we go forth taking the gospel until the fullness of the Gentiles come. Then we will be gathered together unto yourself when the world will rejoice and lavish in the fatness and the riches of your grace and your glory day in, day out. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us. We pray as a church. We pray even for Israel today that they would see the Messiah. They would see the Messiah soon and be drawn to yourself. We give you thanks for your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.